So thank you for all for joining us. I'm David Trapps from the University of Calgary, fan of medicine doctor. Most of the work for this presentation has actually been done by Lazarus, who's joined me on the stage here, Lazarus uh, Enidis, who is um, uh, here in Thess Thessaloniki. And uh, so if there's, if there's difficult questions, I'll be ducking them and passing them off to Lazarus. So laugh or cry, the rest is all semantics. And um, uh, I have the usual disclaimers in terms of um, uh, I'm being a good boy, just like Gwen was saying earlier, you've got to declare your Creative Commons um, uh, biases, etc. So the material is mostly Creative Commons uh, available, etc. And sadly, I don't make money off this. Alrighty. And my screen is not refreshing here, which is a bit annoying, so I'm going to have to turn away from you. So here's the laugh or cry. Uh, when someone writes, etc., it's all about semantics. So why the heck are we doing this? The, the, um, doing this semantic indexing, as uh, any of you who are um, uh, suffer suffering through Dimitri's last presentation will see that it can be quite a lot of work. What is the problem we're trying to fix here? And um, the, the challenge that I want to get into here is finding stuff. So first of all, how is it that docs, when they're trying to find information, how do they, how do they find stuff? How do they find cases? How do they find material? And there's some interesting uh, work being done on uh, foraging theory. Uh, and yes, with uh, uh, and the way we pick around and sort of a little bit here, a little bit there is remarkably animalistic in some ways. The, the more important thing is that we're trying to get um, uh, bang, bang for buck. You know, we are all inherently lazy. Or we should maybe be thinking of it that we're not lazy, that uh, we're efficient in our use of time and resources. And so what we're trying to do is on the old uh, receiver operator curves there, we're trying to optimize what we find for the amount of information we put into it. We're trying to maximize that bulge of getting the most return we can get compared to the effort. So, metadata is a lot of what this conference is about, and the um, metadata is supposed to fix all these problems for us. The challenge, though, in the past, the, you know, the idea of sharing this in metadata is not a new thing. Metadata standards have been around for a long time, and, and the granddaddy has been um, SCORM. And uh, who here actively uses SCORM heavily in their, in their, in their, in their content? Okay, so you guys, guys do, and I'm sure it's delightful and nice and uh, easy to work with, isn't it? We've, we've, tri we've tried a few times. We find that uh, generally it's rather rigid as a format, and trying to tie systems together and, and uh, building things heavily on SCORM is just too, it's, it's like having concrete boots on. Um, the trouble is, though, the job isn't over until the paperwork's done. You're supposed to apply all this metadata to your cases once they've written them. And I don't know about those of you who have uh, clinical authors who are writing cases for you. It's like pulling hen's teeth to try and get them to complete the metadata. It is uh, a real struggle. And, uh, and as we saw this morning, even when the software is running well, there's a lot of information to put in there, and it's very hard to get them to do it. Worse, when you do ha have uh, some of this metadata, some of it's pretty clunky. I came across this uh, tool from uh, uh, NIH. So NIH, National Institutes of Health, pretty well funded. Like, it's this American government, et cetera, a lot of money to play with. And their MetaMap tool is uh, just a little ugly in terms of, of what it produces. So if you have, and apologies for the readability there, but that's a standard. That's just a paragraph of text out of one of our cases, which we fed into MetaMap. And that's what we got out. Pages, we got 31 pages of text like that. What the heck are you supposed to do with that? So, a bit of a challenge. Now, um, a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about here relates to virtual patients. Is this a group that pretty much knows what virtual patients is? Who are familiar with virtual patients? More importantly, who has no idea what I'm talking about and needs six slides of one person? Okay. So if it's just one person, I'm not going to spend a lot on this, but it's basically, it's not virtual reality. It's screen-based stuff. It's, it's like choose your own adventure storybook stuff. Uh, but I'm not going to spend much time on that since most of you know about it. I will get straight to uh, a, a little clinical example. And I use this quite a lot as my, as my uh, go-to example of why are we doing this semantic stuff anyway? So 
at, at the moment, we have on uh, one of our main open labyrinth servers, we have over 600 cases. And I'm pretty familiar with them, and I know them pretty well. But one of my clinicians comes to me and says, um, we need a chest pain case. Oh, yeah, we've got, we've got several on uh, infarcts and angina and stuff. No, 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 that not that chest pain. You know, the stuff we see in eMERGE all the time, the chest wall pain, the nonspecific one, the, the, the one which drives the residents nuts because they, they are pretty sure it's not a heart attack, it's not angina, but they're not sure what else. Do you have one like that? Oh, we probably do, says I. So how do you find that? How are you going to find that case? Now, if you're lucky, there's a case in there which is David's chest wall pain case. But Murphy's Law abounding, it's not going to be like that. And so how are you going to find it? Well, if it's in the, in the keywords, it might be findable. But if it's not on those two spots, how are you going to find it? And if you search all the content, you still get into the problem that that phrase that concept could be coded or described in a number of different ways. There are tons of synonyms for it, and we'll get into those shortly. But that's the problem is, what are you going to look for? Now, the problem also with trying to pull the information out of our cases is that this is, this is deep web stuff. All our cases are in a database, and they're only fed up one page at a time. So the likes of Google is not going to be terribly helpful. Demetrius was saying this morning, you've got to forget about Google for some of this stuff. Well, this is a reason why. Google doesn't find our cases because apart from a few titles here and there, most of the information is just fed from a database, and that's typical of the deep web. So your searching database is not the text. Now, there are tools that, that uh, do this. I've got a, um, uh, some software on my laptop called uh, Devon Agent, which does deep web searching, and sometimes it's very good. And as a little, I thought, oh, I'll sick uh, Devon agent onto, onto this chest wall pain thing, just as a little demonstrator. Well, it ran for 14 hours. Nice rapid search. It, came, it did come up with some stuff. It came up with 127 results. And when you picked into them, they weren't bad, but they weren't brilliant. Like, you know, compared to Google sort of doing a, uh, a general search, it was reasonable relevance. But 14 hours was a little longer than I think most of our students are prepared to wait. Just a shade. All right. So, so why don't we just throw big, hard machinery at it? You've seen the wonderful stuff that Watson can do. And Watson, uh, you guys are familiar with the IBM Watson and the, the Jeopardy challenge. That was a fairly remarkable piece of, of coding and programming. And a $4 billion computer and, uh, and two years worth of programming specifically to tackle this game. And it sounded very much like a one-off, like, well, great, you know, great, uh, great for IBM, but that's going to be use useful for any of us. Well, IBM is selling the Watson service and selling the hardware. The hardware is actually not that expensive. When you don't have to solve games like Jeopardy, when you can take the domain of knowledge down to something fairly useful, the hardware is only about thirty to forty thousand dollars, which is more than the average researcher's budget, but it's well within a medical school's budget. Now, on top of those is all the costs from IBM of, of servicing, et cetera. It isn't just as simple as that. You can imagine what an IBM contract is like. But at least yeah, that's something which is not as far off as we think. Because remember, in Jeopardy, it had to deal with a vast range of knowledge. It had to deal with a single question. And it had one shot at getting the answer right. Within medicine, it, it's allowed to ask for further questions. And it's allowed to dis distill the knowledge down. So it's potentially useful, but still a bit out of reach for most of us, isn't it? All right, so here we go, the power of semantics. So it's, uh, we've been talking about it a little bit, and it's, it's basically, it's all about concepts rather than words. It's not searching for, for, for phrases. And to come back to that uh, chest wall pain case that we had earlier, we're trying to find ways in which chest wall pain might be described. And this is where you can go. There's, there's lots of stuff out there to help you. So all these semantic vocabularies and ontologies and sorry, if anybody's going to be clever and ask me what the difference is between a vocabulary and ontology, I know you build vocabularies out of ontologies, and anything else, I look vaguely at, at Lazarus, and I'll have him explain that. But anyway, this stuff is all made for you. There are lots and lots of them out there. They're all pre-built, and they're there to help you out. Okay? So you have these, um, these ontologies, but then it's still, what are you supposed to do with them? This is what we'll get into in terms of 
um, of trying a little hands-on stuff here. Now, um, we can do a little hands-on. I'm a little scared to try this because uh, after this morning's uh, uh, struggle, it's one of these things where uh, we don't have uh, uh, a lot of time to do this, but um, we can either uh, try, try, a few people try this as, as a group, or we can just do a walkthrough on the stage. I have eight slots set up on our server, so we've got eight volunteers who want to try it on their own. We can assign usernames to you, and then for the rest of you, I'll just, I'll just work my way through how you would do this. Do we have eight people who want to try it, or should we just see what's on the screen? No takers for that, so let's uh, just... Okay, you'd like to try? So if you log into that um, URL, the olabdev.tk, and if you, and it says SEM1, if you start with SEM2 for a username, I've, I've used one already for uh, a pre-built case, which I'll just show you in a second. SEM2 password for anybody that, so if this, somebody else wants to try it, do SEM3, SEM3, SEM4, 5, 6, and the password's the same for everybody. Uh, SEM2. 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 SEM1 I used already. Same password for everybody. And then I'll flip across the screen and show you what you should see. So because I'm logged in as me, I have access to all of them, but you should have access to just a case that will be named more or less the same for your name. So if you're SEM2, it would be test2, test3, test4, et cetera, and just click on the blue link. I'm going to go down and do number one and cheat because it's been done already. So it'll take you down to a page like that. Go across to the uh, left Excuse side. me. Yes. From home, we can repeat the procedure. I just log in. I yeah. am home page. I go chess, chess pain uh, semantics, test two. That's the one, so click on the blue link. So if you're test two, this is test three, but uh, test, so click on the blue link on the side here. And I'm going to click on one. Should take you to a page like that, the details page. And then we'll go into nodes. And this is the node editor. Any of you who are familiar with Open Labyrinth, this will be really obvious stuff. This is a slightly customized version. And what we're going to do is we're going to just do a quick uh, flip through the nodes, doing some semantic annotation as we go. Nice and easy to do. So we'll start with the first node. And this one's been pre-done, um, but it will look largely the same. So you'd normally just have plain text in here and to get it to do its thing, it does some automatic annotation. We picked a bunch of ontologies already, and you just click on that annotate button there, and you will get a bunch of little colored blue names. And some of these things are helpfully annotated already. So for instance, we have hypercholesterolemia there, which it's recognized as a clinical term. But it's not very picky, you'll notice. There's also things, it's less helpful things like bed. I'm not quite sure which ontology decided that a, the bed was useful, but it will place for you a lot of um, semantic annotations already. And then if you're happy with those, you just save the changes. If there's something you want to get rid of, so for instance, I'm not sure that he is is terribly helpful. Just click on it delete, just take out that, that annotation. And we'll get into shortly as to whether it's important to make it all nice and clean or whether you just accept what I call the, 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 the dirty version, the, okay, well, it's, it's close enough and just accept it warts and all. Save the changes down the bottom for each node. So it's doing a lot of the work for you. It's a little bit tedious working through each node at a time, especially in a longer case, and we're working on a way around that. But much of the work, it's being done for you. You're not having to get in and put in that, that data. And it's pulling those lookups, those terms, those annotations from a list of those pre-built ontologies. 
All right. Making sense? Questions about that so far? Because I think the guys who are playing with it, I want to move on to uh, showing you what happens when you when you use the stuff. You know, the, the the so what part. But any questions about how to how to annotate a case at the moment? Pretty straightforward, I think. Just a little bit tedious at the moment with the with the iterative cycle. Okay. All right. So the question that would then be, so what? Okay. Come on. Wakey, wakey. Mm -hmm. There we go. So you'd have a bunch of pages like that with um, annotations applied to them and saved. So now what? What can you do with this? So first of all, the, 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 the point about the dirty versus the clean annotation. When we first um, were trying to design this, I was working on the assumption that having the ability to clean up what, what the automatic annotator came with was going to be important. That you, you don't want all these uh, extraneous phrases like he is and bed and man and things like that. Um, I'm not so convinced that's important anymore. So there's uh, two things, or two, well, several things you can do, but there's two things I want to show you about what you can do with this. So we're going to look at a little bit at, at how this changes the searching, and we're going to sh show you a few visualizations which can come out of the data. So on, this, uh, on the semantic search, you, would, um, you, can, do, you can search on, on uh, data within the content, which is what we were just looking at now. You can also apply semantic terms to the metadata, to the descriptors. So, so the, um, and that would be closer to what Demetrius was showing this morning. So you'd have things like what level of learner, um, what's, uh, where's the content from, what are the, um, what are the types of licenses you're going to apply. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So the searching itself, it isn't terribly fast. Again, because it's going to, for each of these words, it's going to a, a, a semantic engine to look them up. When you do a search, it is going to take three or four minutes per search term, which is not speedy by Google terms, but the alternative has been as follows. If I'd done the same kind of search looking for chest wall pain or thoracic pain and plugged that into my 600 cases, typically I would get zero hits. And then I'm stuck with slogging through them manually, trying to remember names and posted cases, et cetera. And that takes hours with 600 cases. So three to four minutes, I'm happy with. And uh, Lazarus was telling me last night, if we put those ontologies, those, those vocabularies of things that uh, onto our own server rather than going to just a public server, that would speed up that search um, by about threefold. So we'd be down to about a minute and a half, which is, that's workable. What you get back, so when I ran the search on thoracic pain, rather than chest wall pain, because ch I'd put the phrase chest wall pain in a few times. I thought, well, that's not going to be very convincing. All it's doing is a text search. Here's what it came up with. So it came up with a number of nodes. So this is getting right into the content. I hope that's readable. You could just blow it up a little bit. Nope, it's not going to expand. Sorry. Um, so it would find the concept of chest pain, and uh, a number of diagnoses of so thoracic pain was successful, but I was also able to search on chest wall pain, and it found the text match, obviously. But even if you used a fairly uh, bizarre term and classic term of thoracodynia, which some of my older physicians might use and nobody else uses much anymore, even though that word never occurs at any point within the case, and even though it's just cross-referencing by going, oh, thoracodynia, you mean chest wall pain, it would still find it. I thought that's kind of useful. All right. So we ran some, sort of ran a few other searches, and um, so breathlessness, another one, would be that's a, a phrase where there's not a very good code for it. Uh, under some systems, the red, but it's, it's a vague symptom, and it's expressed a number of different ways. You could be breathless, you could be short of breath, you could be out of breath, you can have dyspnea, you could be dyspneic. Again, what are you going to search for? Same idea. We put in put in breathless. And um, 
what I found quite neat was not only did it come, out, come across the cases that I'd set up and indexed and thinking, this is, this is going to show how it's so clever, it also found some cases that I'd forgotten that indexed about palliative care, etc. Oh, yeah, there was some breathlessness in that. So even for me, it was a delightful little surprise. It was bringing up cases which I hadn't anticipated. Did another little one on uh, so dyspnea, uh, dyspnea etc. And then we did one on fatigue. Again, how do you describe that? It's not very well coded. You could be tired. You could be out of energy, etc. Lots of different synonyms and ways of describing it. And again, it was nice and uh, accurate finding these. Now, it doesn't always work. Oh, sorry, before I get on to fatigue, it was even smart enough that when I put in chronic fatigue syndrome, and I kind of thought I would get a whole bunch of false hits on that, because under depression, they're often chronically fatigued, and the chronic fatigue would come up often enough. I'm delighted to find that when I searched on the phrase chronic fatigue syndrome, it only found matches on that. And I'm not going to say it's perfect all the time. And certainly there was, oddly, for, for dizziness, I ran a case on dizziness, and it was remarkably stupid at that. I don't know if it's something where, across all the ontologies, that it is um, the dizziness is not well described, but it was, it was a bit of a bust on that one. So it's not perfect, but it's a big advantage over what we had before. All right. So searching, finding things. Now, the, again, you sort of go, well, yeah, but it's, it's a bit hit or miss, and it's not very exact. Well, for me, having a, case, you know, like a list of 10 or 12 cases which might work, and I can go through them then and go, oh, well, maybe, mm, don't know about that one, don't know about that one. Oh, that might be, oh, look, at, oh, that one will work nicely. And then, oh, no. To be able to pick two from a list of 12 is so much easier than getting none or having to go through all 600 manually. So it's turned out to be much more useful than I thought it would be. And the good news on this, this was all done with uh, what I call dirty annotation. That there was only a couple of cases I went through and cleaned them up, decided that was such a pain in the butt to do that not just gonna get on and do it. And those, those odd little phrases which creep in, like he is and bad and stuff like that, didn't matter. So not that much work. All right. Other cool things you can do with it. There were some neat visualizations you can do. Now you guys are all familiar with word clouds. You can fire in any old uh, set of words into, into a word cloud generator. What was neat about this is that this word cloud on asthma was all generated from concepts in the case, not from word hits in the case. And for some of our cases, that word cloud is a nice little uh, visual description of what the case is about. Some of our authors just really like that, so that's going to be quite useful. And then we, um, Lazarus also generated for me a link to a chord diagram. So have you guys played with chord diagrams at all? So this is, it's, it's these, these uh, curving, uh, curving entities, and basically you can get it to relate concepts. You can... Um, uh, I, I hesitate to bring it up live just now, but you can click at one of these uh, nodes around the edge and it'll show up only those other nodes which are related to it. Uh, visually quite useful. All right. How are we doing for time? So the... Um, there's a number of other things that you can do with this stuff, which I think is... Um, potentially very useful. So once this metadata is in your system, you can choose to make it, um, you can expose it in different ways. So um, you can expose it to Sparkle endpoints, as Demetrius was saying this morning. And, and the beauty of that is that you can start to do federated search. Rather than having to go to one server with 600 cases, another server with 200 cases, that with, with just one engine, I can now, would now be able to search across multiple cases. The, um, what we intend to do as well is to take, uh, generate flat files of this annotated stuff and make that expo uh, expose that to the web crawlers, and that should start to light up on uh, just to even plain Google searches in a much better way some of this material. All right, so just a couple more things to rattle about, and then we can uh, get on some questions if you want. So we had so um, the so they have the flat file export. One of the things that uh, has has occurred to us in working on this stuff is that um, the way that semantic indexing works, the databases all deal with triples. 
So you have the subject, predicate, object. It's, it's just the way these, these structures uh, work. There's some other work we're doing just now with uh, the Tin Can API, which is looking at performance metrics. And when you look at it, the, 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 the uh, learning record store stores its stuff in exactly the same way. They're triples. It's Bob, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> it's Bob did this. It's descriptions of activity, and again, they're triples. And there are a lot of similarities between the structures which you think we ought to uh, make use of. Uh, the other area that we think will be that have a great possibility is in item generation. Increasingly, our, uh, our schools and courses are using Open Labyrinth as like a, an exam emulator, but it is a pain to keep on generating questions and variances of questions, and uh, we're looking into using the same uh, approach for, uh, for tagging and generating questions which can be tweaked a little bit and so you're not having to rewrite questions all the time. You can take an existing question, just take a few little variants in the stem or the or responses and repurpose them. So a last little look at, um, uh, so this is the page of visualizations that uh, uh, Lazarus pointed me to, and there's some lovely stuff there. We're just trying to think of some, some cool ways in which you could use some of these, uh, these curves. And what was particularly interesting about this set was that um, the, the elements, the, the pieces which make up these uh, visualizations, um, it's kind of like Lego blocks that you can take uh, blobs of a certain type and Bezier curves and various other things and build your own... Um, visualizations out of these things, all open source, all accessible. Take a mathematician slightly smarter than I am to, well, um, that won't be hard, most mathematicians are way smarter than I am. Um, but you can build some of this uh, yourselves. So I'll leave that uh, graph up at the end there because I'd be interested in ideas from the group as to what, what would you use some of these diagrams for? How would you use it to help visualize your data? Okay, there we go. Quick rapid blast through, and we'll throw it open for questions and uh, not um, take up too much of Natalia's time. I would like to, to tell that uh, on Friday I present a, a diagnosis uh, program f uh, based in uh, ICD-10 the international codification names of the disease also symptoms. If the papers was written uh, in the international codification, it uh, could be easy to identify, to find one, with the criteria th that we fix. So chest pain, like a basic complaint, and uh, not uh, that particular uh, condition. So let me just rephrase the question just to make sure I've got the question right. So the question would be that you could rephrase them as concepts and diagnoses with related phrase itself? Yes, every symptoms, every medical symptom yes. and condition could be described by the international coding name. So if also the papers, uh, uh, when, we, when we are looking for medical cases, for uh, various reasons. If uh, the text that we are uh, um, process is uh, using these international code names, it uh, could be easy to identify what we are looking for. So, like we are, uh, we are moving uh, in the next years in the semantic uh, web. Great. Could be the same in uh, medicine, could be use the international code names for make more easy to the machines or the softwares to find uh, what we are looking for with the logical uh, re request, like the example uh, we was seeing. Right, so it's the same approach. So, so I, I think you will find that to be very helpful. What I'd be interested in sharing information about as we move through this is looking at which of these um, vocabularies or ontologies, which are the ones which turn out to actually be useful? Because there are lots of them out there and variants on these. So for instance, on ICD, there's ICD-9, ICD-9-CM, ICD-10, etc., etc., And they're all very simple. And yes, you could have your semantic engine just look at all of these. But there are hundreds of thousands of terms per ontology 
and the more ontologies you get it to look at, the slower the search is going to be. So what we're going to be looking at is which over time, which are the ones which turn out to be most useful and hopefully dump some of them which are, or be able to refine the search so that if you're looking at a lab test compared to a symptom, that, that we'll be able to connect it with different ontologies to look up. So labs, you might look up the low ink set or HL7 and things like that. So, so if you're interested in exploring that same idea over the next uh, year or so, we'd, we'd love, to, love to collaborate on that. Uh, as I understand, uh, in the annotation part that you demonstrated, uh, you used uh, quite a few, as I understand, uh, ontologies in order to uh, bring the relations with the terms. Uh, I'm not sure I'm phrasing this correctly. Uh, is the, uh, do you have implemented some kind of uh, outside world communication? I mean, if uh, one ontology or two are not in this pool of ontologies that you used, uh, are the semantics of uh, the other world ontologies uh, discoverable from your annotation? I'm going to pass that question over to Lazarus because okay, I can Lazarus make a guess at an answer, but here's, he's here's the expert now, for you. Okay. Those are the ontologies included in the BioPortal, BioOntology BioPortal uh, platform. So in case you don't find uh, the desired ontology there, you could easily add it and uh, make connections with synonyms uh, to the other ontologies if it is uh, of biomedical nature. Okay if I may follow through. Uh, so uh, there's not uh, uh, an automatic search in all the ontology space in the web yet? No, it's, it's not looking at all of them, and I think that would probably take uh, way too long. But you can, uh, to get a sense for it, so one of the things I found interesting to do was because on the case that I was, I was trying to make a demonstration case on dizziness, and uh, so I thought, well, why is it not finding anything? It was finding no hits at all with the same process. And so I went to the uh, bio portal and just ran different variants and different synonyms for dizziness uh, against, and with its own search engine, it searches all the ontologies it has, uh, uh, has access to. And surprisingly, it, it, it's, it's a disease or a symptom which isn't well coded in many of the systems, so so that that was that was strange for me. And I, I, so this is why I was saying it's not a perfect system; it's just a huge step over what we had before. Okay. So anybody got any ideas as to as to what you would use some of these pretty graphs for? I mean, there it's a it's a uh, and and they're they're all open source. That's. Uh, um, if anybody's interested, I can certainly send you the link to um, uh, the page that Lazarus found with these. But for instance, that, that stream graph where you have sort of different flows going through that dark blue one on the right hand side, you go, oh, that would be so useful for, but I wasn't just sure in terms of the activity flows or the data you're pulling out of a case, well, what would you actually use that for? Does that gel for anybody in terms of, oh, you could pull out this kind of information. I'm, I'm making you work in a workshop here, so you, you're contributing to the group knowledge. Any ideas on, on how we could use some of these? So that's the trouble with doing a workshop right after lunch. Everybody's got the postprandial snoozies. that would be that people would be able to get a better idea of what uh, this uh, graph represents. So uh, if your question was when could we use it exactly, ask people to interpret the graph as an activity. Yeah, good, thank you. Uh, have you guys seen Hans Rosling stuff on TED with Gapminder and, the, and the, the, the graphics that he does with like world population and economics and stuff like that? Really powerful stuff with... Uh, well, it's the, the same elements that, that he uses are accessible in this set. 
so we'll be able, we'll be able to do cool gap minder stuff with virtual patient data so it's kind of kind of excited to be able to do uh, somebody else had a suggestion across in the corner here a status uh, I will take the other approach and uh, I'll try to say where uh, I can find this diagram useful maybe the bubble chart could somehow summarize the um, most common annotation and uh, also group them in uh, colors regarding the area. Maybe group them together as nodes or something like that. That's an idea. Just, just the, with the circle packing, etc. Yeah, okay. We could also group the terms by their parent terms. For example, uh, medical specialty and have the bubble chart uh, be more hierarchical. Okay, and use the bubble for that because there was also those dendrograms, which yes, are sort of the, yes. the again it's that remember the uh, things with phylums and kingdoms and all that sort of stuff from uh, biology. That same sort of idea where you have common roots. So, lots of different ways. So I won't won't belabor you too long when you when you have the after lunch snoozies there. But uh, um, this is the sort of stuff we'll be exploring. But the neat thing is it comes out of the the thinking and the concepts, not just the word searches from the cases there. Alrighty. Well, any, yes, go ahead. Have you considered uh, something uh, about, uh, uh, instead of education, about content creation? Maybe cross-indexing with uh, image uh, databases or something like that to get relevant material in order to uh, facilitate better content for the case, for enriching a uh, case. Uh, mining from the text. Uh, terms that later can be used in order to create more uh, uh, beautiful nodes? Um, I hadn't. That's a very good idea. And I, I, I would invite you just to explain that a little bit more because I'm sort of grasping the concept there. Yeah, but I'm also uh, sleep the, deprived the of two nights of two hours sleep. So. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, the idea comes from uh, trying to do that this work to uh, transfer virtual patients in 3D environments. It's something that uh, I'm boring Lazarus with last uh, month. Okay. Uh, and uh, it, it sounds cool that uh, if we could uh, uh, mine the text and then discover graphical content from other ontologies, from uh, image uh, gotcha. recognition right. ontologies, or better yet, uh, 3D asset. Uh, uh, ontologies, if there exist, I'm not sure. I think they do. Uh, so that kind of stuff. And that relates to the thing you told me at dinner last night, which I forgot to uh, get into in our description here. Do you want to uh, say a few more words about the potential of that? Because what you were describing for me at dinner last night was, I, th I think this is a great idea. It's not exactly what I was telling you last night, but okay. uh, what Panos is saying is that uh, we could uh, have some uh, repository of uh, content, and uh, you could either enrich your virtual patient automatically from this repository. So say, for example, you're editing a virtual patient, and uh, the platform uh, suggests you some images to embed in the text. Or even better, you could uh, transfer your virtual patient in another environment, another context, and have some content like 3D objects uh, automatically generated for you so that you can play it like a game. Okay. Interesting stuff. And it br brings to mind for me one other thing that, that um, uh, we're tempted to explore. When we're trying to generate uh, word maps for free text matching, so um, many of you who write um, virtual patient cases, generally it's think of the choices pre-script them, write them out, and you know, what's, your, what's your diagnosis? You give them half a dozen things to pick from, but you're also cueing the learner as to what the potential things are, and it's tr trying to move their thinking beyond just uh, recall and single best answer research. Sometimes it's nice to, what do you think the diagnosis is, and just have free text input. The problem with that is that what do you do with that free text input? And I'm gonna chat a bit more about that uh, tomorrow evening. But natural language processing or working with that can be incredibly difficult. 
and one of the things we wondered about using was having the semantic lookup tool be able to remind our authors when that, so this is not during case play, but when they're case authoring. If you have to generate a list of synonyms or potential ways that something is phrased, to use the semantic lookup for that so that they can then get a list of 20 or 30 things which they can strike and delete rather than have to key them and uh, key them in with all their variations. So some potential there, I think. All right, I think I've about used my time here. I'm gonna hand over to uh, Natalia and her colleague. Thanks very much and thanks for the great questions there.